Hello, hello everyone. I am just starting a little bit early just so that people can get on. So we got about a minute until I'm going to start. We'll see if I can see anyone on here. But I am coming at you guys right now from my kitchen. I changed from my heart health um, uh, presentation that I did a little while ago because um, I think this might be a little bit better. Uh, so I see we have two people on here. So hello. There's Rebecca. Hello, Rebecca. Um, I actually... Uh, there was, there's a little bit of a glare on here still, but um, it got, it was a lot worse when I didn't cover up my windows, so hopefully this will work out. Hello, Deb. Nice to see you. Hello, hello. Okay, I am going to get started here. So um, I'm going to introduce myself again. My name is Danielle. Um, I am one of the exercise physiologists at the Old Saybrook location. Um, and if you did not watch my uh, heart health um, presentation a little while back, uh, I just a quick little overview. I am. Um, a clinical exercise physiologist, and I have a couple of years of experience in cardiac rehabilitation. Oh, there's my mom. Hello, mom. Nice to see you. <laughs> so uh, I um, uh, am not technically a expert in diabetes, but I have worked with a lot of people who have diabetes, and I have um, helped them manage their diabetes while exercising um, in our cardiac rehab program. So um, I'm by no means an expert. If you have any like real pressing issues, I highly suggest you go to your doctor or um, your endocrinologist or a diabetes specialist. Um, but hopefully I can give you um, a couple of tips and tricks that will um, help you out and just kind of understand diabetes a little bit more. So um, I'm going to first be going over kind of what diabetes is, um, type 1 diabetes, type 2 diabetes, as well as pre-diabetes um, and metabolic syndrome. And then um, I will go into how to manage that and how exercise can affect your blood sugar. So this is not only for people um, with diabetes. If you're a person that eats you have to manage your blood sugar. Um, so hopefully this can give you some insight. So let's get started. So what is diabetes? And I am going to have to apologize for um, my uh, screen. <laughs> it is a little hard to, um, to see everything here, but so I'm gonna first talk about um, what is diabetes? So it is um, an increase in your blood sugar due to defects in your body's ability to uh, secrete insulin or the inability to use the insulin in your body. So I'm going to bring the camera forward a little bit so that you can see my picture a little bit better. Here we go. So <laughs> let's see how this works out. So this here is a cell and the insulin is like a key, and it unlocks, unlocks the door that allows the glucose to go into the cell. So that's what this is over here. It's unlocking the door to let the glucose into the cell. So when you eat food, oh, that's a little bit better. Um, when you eat food, your um, body has to, you know, it digests the food, turns it into glucose or sugar, um, and then um, that sugar has to get into your cells to allow to, um, you know, fuel your body and to allow it to be stored and used. So um, when this mechanism does not work, that is when um, diabetes can occur. There we go. So type one is sometimes thought of as juvenile diabetes um, because you know it happens. Uh, it, it tends to occur when um, people are children um, because it is an autoimmune disease and it's a destruction of cells in the pancreas that create insulin. So type one diabetes is the one where um, your body is not able to make it. 
So I'm going to move the screen a little bit forward again. I appreciate you guys bearing with me. But here are some symptoms of diabetes, and the ones that are in blue are the um, uh, ones that happen that are more common in type 1 diabetes. So um, there are a lot of gastric problems like nausea, vomiting, and abdominal pain, um, even respiratory problems, hyperventilation, uh, because you're trying to, um, you know, regulate the things that you're not able to regulate because you're not using the glucose um, correctly, weight loss, uh, smell of acetone on the breath, um, as well as lethargy and stupor because um, your central nervous system actually needs glucose to work correctly. Um, then if you look down here, um, you, you might be urinating too much and have, whoops, sorry about that, have glucose or sugar in your urine. So those are um, just some symptoms of diabetes. Um, so now metabolic syndrome, um, a lot, uh, there are five or, uh, let me see, one, two, three, four, five, five uh, symptoms and signs of metabolic syndrome. And if you have three of them, that means um, you could possibly have metabolic syndrome. Um, and prediabetes kind of goes along with this, or it can go along with this. So metabolic syndrome, and now I'm moving the camera again. <laughs> uh, the risk factor, uh, if you have three of these five risk factors, that puts you um, at a higher risk for developing diabetes, and it means that you have something called metabolic syndrome. So um, central obesity, uh, meaning that your waist circumference is greater than 40 inches for men or greater than 35 for women. Um, high triglycerides, which has to do with your, um, your uh, cholesterol. Um, a low HDL, which if you watched my um, heart health one, you'll know that HDL is the happy or good cholesterol. So you need that to kind of help bring the cholesterol back to your liver to uh, process it. Um, a, an elevated blood pressure um, and a high fasting glucose. Obviously, this is the one I wanna talk about. So right here, fasting glucose greater than or equal to 110 milligrams per deciliter. Um, so I'm not going to go into all of the mechanics of um, how the fasting glucose is measured or anything like that, but um, your fasting glucose should be, um, you know, as a blood um, blood test, should be anywhere from 70 to 100 milligrams per deciliter if you are uh, healthy and absorbing glucose correctly. And fasting just means that you haven't eaten um, in a certain amount of time, anywhere from, uh, three to four hours or so, I think, don't quote me on that. <laughs> um, but uh, so basically we want that to be lower. So once it actually gets to 126, that is when you have prediabetes um, or one uh, anywhere from 110 to 125 is prediabetes and 126 is diabetes. Uh, so there is that. Oh, number one thing, there is hope. You can reverse these things. I think that is really important for me to get across. Like a lot of this stuff sounds kind of low and sad, but you can absolutely um, reverse these symptoms with lifestyle change, diet and exercise. Okay, so now going into type 1 diabetes a little bit. Um, and again, I will move it closer. I think after this uh, slide, it gets a little bit better. Um, but when you have type 2 diabetes, it probably means that you had metabolic syndrome and then got pre-diabetic and then developed diabetes after that. And basically it means that the insulin, um, uh, there's insulin resistant skeletal muscle. So your adipose tissue and your liver, all of those cells are not accepting the key, the insulin key and not letting the glucose into the um, cells. Um, so then as it 
develops, it can be followed by a decreased insulin secretion, which is why I wrote over here, type two diabetes can turn into type one. And I kind of touched on that before too. Um, the body can create, um, or, so the body creates the insulin, the key doesn't work. So the body creates more insulin, the key continues to not work. Maybe it works a little bit better when there is more insulin. But the body ends up getting to a point where, um, you know, the insulin just doesn't work at all. And then the pancreas kind of gets a burnout and then it stops creating uh, the insulin. I will get into that again. <laughs> um, so I'm going to bring it forward a little bit. I think this one uh, basically just explains what I just said. Um, your body eats the food, turns it into the glucose, the blood glucose tries to get into the cell, but it doesn't happen, and it stays in the body. And we're bringing it on back. And again, this is what I was saying, the fasting blood sugar is greater than 126. Um, that is uh, where we come to uh, being dosed with being diagnosed with diabetes. And um, there's something here called hemoglobin A1C. And this is something that I just think is interesting. Um, so this is, again, a blood test um, where there's kind of like an imprint in your blood of what your blood sugar has been for the last three months or so. So um, if your hemoglobin A1C is um, above 6.5. Oh, I just noticed that a lot of people have commented and I haven't seen any any of these comments. This happened to me last time too. Hello, hello everyone. I will respond to you all when um, when I get there. Hello, Sarah. Hello, Karen and Brittany. Okay, hopefully this updates as I, <laughs> as I keep looking at it now. Um, anyway, the hemoglobin A1C um, is kind of helps the your doctor or your endocrinologist see how you've been um, keeping up with your diet um, over the past three to four months. So if you have been keeping your fasting blood sugar at, let's say, at 126 when before, like way, way before it was in the 300s, um, then your hemoglobin A1C would reflect that. Um, and that's a number that when I was in cardiac rehab, I would look at a lot for my patients um, to see how they're, uh, um, you know, how they've been doing at managing their diabetes. I think that's it for this slide. So some complications that come across, uh, come along with diabetes. Um, we probably all know that diabetes is a problem and um, usually people who have diabetes kind of end up getting other things as well or other um, diseases or uh, problems in their body. So the excess sugar causes inflammation and I talked about inflammation in my heart health presentation and there we also have a presentation um, by Lisa Vassell uh, where she talks about inflammation as well. So inflammation can cause a lot of damage to um, all organs and tissues. Um, and this is kind of where it comes in that the pancreas can stop making the insulin. It just gets too damaged. There's too much overload. Um, but I'm going to, again, bring the camera a little bit far forward again. And... Um, so it can affect the eyes. So getting diabetic retinopathy, glaucoma, or cataracts, uh, renal failure, diabetic foot. If you um, have ever heard of like people with diabetes having to lose a part of their foot, I'll explain that in a moment. Um, stroke and heart damage. So um, cardiac disease, cardiovascular disease, and diabetes kind of go hand in hand. Hello, Karen. Um, and then also a nerve disease, peripheral neuropathy, as well as arthrosclerosis, which goes along with cardiovascular disease. So um, that nerve disease and the diabetic foot, it kind of, it basically goes hand in hand. Um, so I mentioned in a, a couple slides earlier that your central nervous system uses sugar as fuel. 
Um, so when your blood sugar is low, you might have a hard time concentrating um, and things like that. So you really do need sugar in your diet to be able to <laughs> fuel your brain and your nerves. Um, and if you have diabetes, it can really affect that. So um, you can get peripheral neuropathy, meaning that in your feet or your hands, you might get some tingling because you're unable to feel um, those parts of your body. Um, and if you, let's say, stub your toe or step on a tack or something and you don't feel that, um, it can lead to an infection and then, um, you know, losing part of your foot. So it's really important someone with diabetes, um, first of all, wears the right footwear when exercising and when being out and about in um, their everyday lives. Um, and also, you know, takes care of their feet, gets their feet checked out every once in a while. Very important. Okay. And this is hyper and hypoglycemia. So I can tell that it is a little hard to read these and I do apologize for that. If anyone wants um, these slides, just for reference, uh, my email will be at the end of the um, presentation. So I would be more than happy to email this to you. But so hyper and hypoglycemia, it's important to understand what these um, symptoms are, if not for yourself or for people with diabetes that may um, be in your life, um, just in everyday life, um, because you could come across someone who is having uh, some kind of an emergency, and it might be good to know, you know, have a little bit of an idea of what might be going on. So um, hyperglycemia, that's when the blood sugar is too high, um, frequent urination, increased thirst, weight loss, exhaustion, blurred vision, and migraines. Um, and even uh, if it's really severe, even uh, cognitive issues too um, can come along with um, having too high of blood sugar. And then for low blood sugar, I think this one is important in general for all people to kind of know what could be um, symptoms of low blood sugar. Uh, because if we're exercising, if we're trying to lose weight, if we're not eating at the right times to help fuel our bodies, um, you could get some of these symptoms. So all you might need is uh, a candy or something to kind of bring you back up. So um, some symptoms of hypoglycemia, hunger, a pounding heart, sweating, um, shaking, difficulty concentrating, and blurred vision. Um, and then there are uh, other ones here like racing thoughts, which kind of goes along with anxiety, uh, tingling in the mouth, slurred speech, um, oh, the difficulty concentrating and anxiety and uh, racing thoughts all go together, um, as well as confusion and unreasonable anger. So all of that can, can go together. And if you notice yourself or your loved one um, showing any of these symptoms that could uh, possibly be something that's going on. So um, I just wanted to talk about those. And um, yes, I'll move on. So managing your diabetes. This is probably um, the most important <laughs> part of the slide. I just wanted to go through kind of the overview for a little bit first, because I, I personally think it's very interesting um, to know what the underlying thing is going on in our bodies with this. And actually, I just remembered something I wanted to say with the hypoglycemia. I'm going to go back. So <laughs> with the low blood sugar, I just wanted to talk about a patient that I had once. Um, he was exercising. He was perfectly fine. He did have diabetes. Um, you know, his blood sugar level was fine while he was, ex uh, before he was exercising. Um, he was doing his thing. And then all of a sudden we just saw his face go like white and he just started sweating profusely and everything. And it was pretty scary. Um, but, you know, we sat him down, gave him actually some sugar packets. That's what worked best for him. I think it was two. Um, and he, you know, was almost not necessarily immediately fine. We had his wife take him home, but he uh, was fine after that. So just a little bit of kind of like a case study to, to go along with that. Um, oh, hello, Doreen. Nice to know you made it. Thanks, Dave. Um, okay, so now we're going on managing diabetes. So 
Um, the three main ways to manage diabetes are uh, your diet, your exercise, and possibly med medication. So diet and exercise also really go into managing pre-diabetes as well to make sure that it doesn't turn into diabetes. Um, and the medications are used to either increase the insulin sensitivity of the cells or to increase the insulin in the body in general. Um, so those are kind of the two uh, major functions of medication in, in someone with diabetes. So we're going to talk about diet first, and I have some interactive stuff too, which I think will be helpful. Um, and again, we can't see this one. I'm so sorry about that. I will bring the um, slide closer again. But so um, with diet, it's uh, I actually said this in my live video on yesterday, which was Monday, <laughs> um, that it's important to eat um, a complex carbohydrate or um, something with protein and fat in order to help stabilize your blood sugar. And this is important for all of us, not just people with diabetes. So um, I'm going to again bring it closer. There we go. So. Um, if you see here, this is a spike in blood sugar um, when eating something like a refined carbohydrate, like sugar, candy, white bread, um, something that doesn't have any quote unquote substance to it. That's just the first word that came to my brain. Um, your blood sugar goes uh, up within, so that's one hour, two hours, three hours. It goes up and down all in just three hours. Um, and that's not very helpful. Um, you know, like I said, we want to make sure we have enough um, blood sugar in our bloodstream in order to maintain brain function and nerve function. Um, so that is probably where you're going to get a high and then crash, like kids eating candy at a birthday party. <laughs> um, but then the yellow one here is when you eat something with protein in it. So it slowly raises the blood sugar over three hours or so. The peak is at, a, at about three and a half hours, and then it goes back down. And then with fat added to, it kind of keeps the blood sugar at a um, more stable level. So I'm going to push this back a little bit again so that we can see me. Um, so having more complex carbohydrates, which I'll talk about in a moment, is helpful. And eating protein and fat with a carbohydrate snack is important too. I think about this in his healthier eating um, presentation that having um, peanut butter with crackers or um, hummus or um, something with protein in it to supplement a carbohydrate snack. Um, I know I, my thing is peanut butter. I love having like peanut butter and apples or peanut butter and banana, all that. Um, and then um, having smaller, more frequent meals or snacks can be a way to, um, you know, help manage your blood sugar as well. Um, and if you have watched any of our nutrition-based presentations, probably one of the main things that kind of ties everything together is having less processed foods, um, more fruits and vegetables, more lean protein and plant-based protein, less added sugar. That is what is going to probably help the most. Something we're going to do in a moment also is practice reading labels. Reading labels is key. <laughs> so going on to the next one. Here are my complex carbohydrates. This is just a little, a little um, comic that I thought was funny. These little carbs asking, how do I know that my existence and consciousness are the same as others? Uh, why are we here asking all these questions? I thought it was just a, a little funny, a little comic <laughs> of complex carbohydrates in their, in their head. Um, but moving on, <laughs> um, some actual complex carbohydrates. There's a nice cheat sheet here, um, as well as the difference between simple and complex carbohydrates. I'm going to move it closer again, and I'm just going to read uh, it off to you a little bit. 
So simple carbohydrates are a little bit easier to digest. I'm reading off of the blue and green one on the side. Um, they uh, tend to uh, contain a sweetness and quickly raise the blood glucose levels, whereas the complex carbohydrate, um, they take time to digest and they use um, a lot of different uh, types of sugars, um, including starches. They're usually less sweet than a simple carbohydrate, and um, they slowly raise the blood glucose levels. So um, those are important things. Then I'll move it over here to see this a little bit more. Here are a couple of complex carbohydrates. If you can read them, and if you can't, I can send this to you. Um, there are a lot of beans on there, oatmeal, oat bran, whole wheat, whole barley. Um, and fruits and vegetables, lentils, split peas, um, cauliflower. I'm just kind of reading all around here. Those are complex carbohydrates that can, um, you know, be a good addition to your diet. And then there's simple carbs down there, table sugar, corn syrup, fruit juice, candy, cake, all, all of that jazz. So um, then on the next slide, I'm not going to spend too much time on it because we probably won't be able to see it. But um, I will post it, actually. After this, um, I'll post these pictures um, as well as this one, a nice little grocery list um, that you can print for your fridge. Um, I will post these on our page um, when I'm done with the presentation. Um, okay. So here we are. I was really excited about this because I got a bad snack as well as a good snack. And we can um, try to uh, kind of see if there's a difference here with reading the label. Um, so we have the Ritz crackers with a hint of salt and then nut thins over here. Um, so nut thins are a, I think, more health food cracker and the Ritz crackers are kind of more decadent a little bit. So if you read the, whoop, I want to go over here. Thank you for joining me on this <laughs> computer journey. Um, if you read this, uh, there are 80 calories in just five crackers. I'm going to try and stabilize my computer here. And I want you to look there are 10 grams of carbohydrates in five crackers, and there is no sugar. There is also less than one gram of protein and um, a decent amount of fat as well, about four grams of fat in just five crackers. Let's see if we can read this one at all. I am just holding my computer here. Okay. So we have in 17 crackers, which um, is way more than five crackers, we have 24 grams of carbohydrates, one gram of fiber, which is good to have a gram of fiber, and actually three grams of protein. So there's a lot more protein in these um, crackers. Uh, and um, so it's just kind of a way um, that we can look at what is in our food and how it might affect our blood sugar in a way. So I just kind of wanted you to take, uh, to take you through um, reading two different types of crackers. So there's different, different things to think about in each cracker. Um, I see that Doreen just said um, something I thought was interesting. My bone density doctor believes processed food contributes to that issue too, if you're looking for another reason. Yeah, absolutely. Processed food contributes to a whole gamut of um, health issues uh, just because it can be harder for our body to digest and it takes out a lot of the um, nutrients that our body normally gets from, um, you know, fruits and vegetables and uh, all of those natural or unprocessed foods. Um, so absolutely, Doreen, minimizing the amount of processed foods that you eat is really important. And I just also want to say that um, it can be hard to um, 
think about diet and think like, oh, well, I need to eat completely one way or else it, you know, I'm done and my diet didn't even matter or whatever. Just making simple, small, consistent um, choices is probably what's going to help you the most. Let's see what we got here now. We're going to talk about exercise. So, um, the uh, exercise actually increases the sensitivity that your cells have to insulin. So um, it makes your uh, cells in your body more um, willing to let that key open the door for the glucose. Um, and it can actually, I um, have it on another slide, but it can actually increase that sensitivity in your body for, um, you know, upwards of 12 hours after your exercise. Um, and combining aerobic and resistance exercise is better than just having one modality alone. Um, that is because once you get your muscle working as well, and you can gain some muscle and get some more um, ability to, uh, you know, connect to your muscle through your brain, um, you know, it can help with weight loss and muscle gain, which can improve your blood sugar levels. Um, and again, exercise does help with decreasing inflammation. Um, on this uh, picture I have right here, there's this lovely lady exercising. And um, I, this is important for people with diabetes for sure, um, including a warm up and a cool down important for everyone, <laughs> but especially um, when you have diabetes to just slowly introduce your body to the, um, uh, the exercise is super important. So include a five minute warm up. Make sure you check your blood sugar before. So um, when I worked in cardiac rehab, we would have our patients check blood sugar before and after exercise. So if their blood sugar was under 70 um, before exercise, we would not let them exercise at all, I don't think. Don't quote me on that. <laughs> um, we would definitely hope that uh, with a little bit of a snack, the blood sugar would come back up. Um, but if it's too low, like I just said, exercise makes your body more sensitive to insulin. So that just makes it take up more of the blood sugar, um, which is not good because then you can get the hypoglycemia. That's just very not good. And then it's also important to check the blood sugar after um, because you don't, um, you know, I wouldn't want someone to leave um, the cardiac rehab center with a really low blood sugar and then drive themselves home and have it dip down even more. Um, so that's why checking your blood sugar is really, really important. Oh, wait, did I miss anything on here? Nope, I talked about all of that. Great. So um, some guidelines for exercise. These are the, um, there is a, um, not procedure, but a acronym that you can think of when thinking of exercise. Um, it's called the FIT principle, uh, the frequency, intensity, time, and type. When you're trying to plan out your own exercise, um, this is actually straight from the American College of Sports Medicine, their guidelines for exercise testing and prescription um, for uh, people with diabetes specifically. So the frequency that specifically people with diabetes should be exercising is three to seven days per week. Um, the intensity is moderate to vigorous. Um, and if you see here the RPE, I actually um, created a uh, YouTube video about the, um, it's called the Borg RPE scale. Um, it's just a way to talk about how hard your exercise feels for you. Um, and uh, 
so there's a video of that on our YouTube page if you would like to learn more about that. But it basically means that um, on a scale of six to 20, if you're at an 11 or 12 or a 14 to 17, um, then you're in the moderate to vigorous range. I know that's kind of a big range, but um, that is the intensity of exercise you should be doing. Uh, the time, um, they put it in terms of minutes per week. So 150 minutes per week of moderate exercise or 75 minutes per week of vigorous exercise or a combination of the two. So um, let's say 150 minutes per week, we're doing five days a week, that's right in between three and seven. That puts you at 30 minutes a day, five days per week of exercise. And this exercise, when we go down to type, it's any prolonged rhythmic activity using large muscle groups. So that's walking, swimming, swimming, <laughs> swimming, and cycling. Um, those are the, but you know, you can do any prolonged activity. So any, um, you know, recumbent bike. If you go to our gyms, we have the new step, which is like a seated elliptical. Um, anything where you're moving most of the, um, the, the big muscles in your body, like your legs and your upper body, um, if you are moving them for a prolonged period of time, that 30 minutes um, at a, uh, an intensity, you are moving, you feel your um, heart rate up, uh, you might be breathing a little bit hard, but you can still carry on a conversation, 30 minutes a day, five days per week. Um, it sounds like a lot. <laughs> I feel like I just used a lot of words to explain that. Um, but the good thing is that if you're not able to do 30 minutes of exercise all at once, there's nothing wrong with breaking up those 30 minutes throughout the day. So um, what I like to suggest is going for a nice short little 10 minute walk in the morning, another, you know, 10 minute cycle midday after lunch, and then maybe another 10 minute walk in the evening um, or two 15 minute bouts of exercise. That will still um, you know, help you out to get all of the exercise that you might need. So I know that at the beginning of this slide, I said that it is um, the uh, guidelines specifically for people with diabetes, but it is very, very close to the guidelines for um, the general population. Uh, 30 minutes a day, at least five days per week at moderate to vigorous intensity. Um, that is basically the minimum amount that we need to, um, you know, feel like we're staying active and get the benefits of exercise that we need. So um, this is a pretty good guideline if you're trying to figure out um, what to do for your uh, exercise program. Um, and I just realized I didn't make this very clear. This is for um, aerobic exercise. Uh, so resistance exercise really depends on the person and what your other um, you know, underlying issues might be. So if you're wondering about what to do for resistance exercise, talk to um, a staff member at joint exercise or joint effort exercise and we can help you out with that. Um, so then I just wanted to talk a little bit about medical interventions too. Um, there are oral medications and injectable medications. Um, the injectable insulin is something that is for um, you know, people who are unable to create their own insulin. Um, and most of the oral medications uh, are for people who can create it but don't have the sensitivity. So it helps to increase the insulin sensitivity and some even help with increasing a little bit of the insulin secretion as well. Um, and blood sugar testing is important. So this right here is a blood sugar um, monitor. You would just stick your finger and uh, test your blood sugar that way. Um, but there are other uh, ways of um, testing your blood sugar. And if you're wondering about ways to um, maybe change your medication or uh, change the way that you're testing your blood sugar, I would definitely recommend speaking to your doctor, endocrinologist, um, whoever helps you manage your diabetes. So some special considerations um, when you 
or someone you love is exercising while they have diabetes. Um, I mentioned this a little while ago, but I think it's really, really important that um, a rapid decrease in blood glucose with exercise um, can occur and it can even um, continue up to 12 hours post exercise. So that is why I was talking about how important it is to um, you know, check your blood glucose before and after exercise and make sure to have small snacks before and after. So um, again, to help stabilize your blood sugar, having something with carbohydrates, protein, and fat um, is super important. And um, right here, I wrote that milk and chocolate milk are some pretty good recovery uh, snacks <laughs> post-exercise. So um, it, at Cardiac Rehab, when we wanted um, to uh, have people increase their blood sugar but keep it stable, we would have milk to give them as a snack. Um, it, you know, all milk, especially chocolate milk, chocolate milk has more carbohydrates than regular milk. Um, but milk, if it's, uh, you know, let's say 2% milk or even whole milk, whole milk has a nice amount of fat in it, fat, protein, carbs, you're good. Um, then the timing of exercise and insulin dosage or just your, um, medication uh, when you're taking your medication in general. Um, so one, one thing to think about is that sometimes uh, the early morning exercise can even show an increase in your blood sugar levels, um, which I did see that a lot when I, you know, during my time at cardiac rehab. Uh, sometimes when people, you know, immediately after finishing their exercise, their blood sugar would be higher than when they came in, especially if those people were in our morning classes. So um, that's just something to look out for and to not be too, too worried about um, just continuing to monitor the blood sugar, um, you know, after exercise and um, continuing on is really important. And staying hydrated is really, really important. If you haven't already, please watch um, Katrina's wonderful presentation about water. Um, it's so important to drink water. And I think I talked about this um, in my heart health um, presentation that sometimes um, if someone has high blood pressure, a doctor may prescribe a diuretic or something that um, helps the body get rid of water. That's because the water in your body kind of goes through your bloodstream. It becomes a part of your bloodstream. Um, so if you are dehydrated, it can show as an increase in your blood sugar. And I've seen this firsthand. Someone has come in, their blood sugar was a little bit on the higher side. We had them drink about eight ounces of water, wait a little while and their blood sugar actually came down. So it's kind of a, um, a pseudo effect <laughs> of it. So, you know, their blood sugar was still elevated, it didn't come down that much. Um, but uh, when you are dehydrated, it also increases your risk for heat illness. And um, backing up to the complications I was talking about, um, people with diabetes might not, uh, might have that peripheral neuropathy. So you might not be able to feel certain effects that you normally would have been able to feel if you didn't have diabetes. Um, so it might be harder to feel that you are starting to um, become, uh, the, you know, have heat stroke or some kind of heat illness. So staying cool and um, staying hydrated while you're exercising very important. And I said this in my um, heart health presentation too, if something feels wrong, say something. You do not need to be a hero. Um, if anything feels wrong, even if you don't have diabetes, even if you think it might just pass, um, you know, telling someone is really, really important to make sure that you stay safe and healthy. And that is basically all that I have for you. So um, this is uh, where I got my um, information. Um, and if you have any questions, please, please, please put them in the comments here, or you can email me at danielle at jointeffortexercise.com. Um, but so I got some information from the American Diabetes Association, 
um, this uh, UK company. That's where I got the um, uh, graphics about the hypo and hyperglycemia, as well as the American College of Sports Medicine um, guidelines for exercise testing and prescription. Um, so again, this is what I have for you today. I will wait a little bit to see if we have any um, any questions coming up. Uh, if you think of a question later on, um, feel free to email me as well. And um, if you would like a copy of these, I'm more than happy to send them to you. So I will wait a moment. Let's see. That was great info. You're very welcome. And thank you all for joining me today. I hope that you've really enjoyed the sunshine. It is so pretty outside. I'm excited to go for a run later. Um, See. Oh, you're welcome, Sandy. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Uh, if we don't have any questions, then I am um, good to go. So uh, one last plug. If you are worried about something medically, please um, talk to your doctor. Uh, and if you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask. You are very welcome, Sarah. All right. Thank you all for joining me. Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.